Right, so today we're finishing off Mark. Anyway, let's start at verse 1. The resurrection. Remember, this is following on from Steve last week and all through the trial, the torture, and the death of Jesus. So when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Now, I think I just read that wrong because I think it's supposed to be Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, not the mother of James and Salome. So just, just to be clear. So Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on, the very first, very early on, the first day of the week, so that's a Sunday, as you already know, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? I find that, for it was very large, I find that an interesting question, because I, I was thinking to myself when I was reading that, well, that would be my first thought. I mean, yes, it's, it's a big stone that goes across the tomb. But I'd be thinking, what about the guards? How are we going to get past the guards who are guarding the tomb, let alone roll away the stone of the tomb? But never mind. And, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. So, sorry, let me start again. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. They, and they went out and fled for the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterwards... He appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up servants with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. An interesting chapter. Shorter than the ones I've been given recently, or we've been talking on recently. And I'm just going to quickly jump in straight away for anyone who's asking any questions. The second half of the passage from verse 9, where, where it gives a more of a summary of what's going on, some Bibles will say this was added later, or not all versions have this. But we're going to look at it anyway. Why? Because I don't think it matters. Because what it says and what it includes is already in other Gospels in the Bible. It's there. There's no untruth in it. It's not giving us some strange idea you know, that Jesus had a pet dog or something. It, um, so it's true. So let, don't discredit something just because people say, oh, well, we're not sure whether it should be there. If it's true, and it's in some, and it's not telling you anything that's not true, we should include it. That's my view. So don't dismiss stuff. Anyway, where are we? See, can you... I wondered how to approach this, because this is such a well-known topic 
particularly for people who've been Christians for many years. And sometimes, I don't know, do we, do we, are we, do we get blasé when we read this? You know, why were they afraid? There was a man dressed in white in the tomb. It's an angel, so what's the problem? Um, why, were they so, why were they so shocked? Why wouldn't they believe? It's clearly obvious what was going on. And I think, you know, I, I sometimes think, do we give the disciples enough credit? You know, you've been following this rabbi for at least three years. You've heard him be called the son of man and the son of David. He has said so much that they're believing this is their Messiah. They've had to endure two days of him being tortured, or two to three days of him being tortured, which finished with him dying on the cross. He's been put in a tomb. Where would you be in such a situation? Where would you be in that scenario? I mean... I was thinking about it because in other Gospels they, t- they talk about, well, they, the chief priests and Sadducees and all that go to the Roman authorities and say, well, look, they might steal his body. They might steal his body. So quick, put a seal across it. Put guards to the tomb. And I'm thinking to, I was thinking to myself, you know what? For those of us who have experienced grief in our lives, you know, when my dad died, the first thing I wasn't thinking about doing was you know, maybe after the funeral or something, it was, quick, let's go and dig him up again. You see, when you've been, when you, all your hopes have been dashed, and when everything that you're holding on for, and a close personal friend of yours has been murdered, for want of a better choice, you're not going to be thinking about this. So as we read through this, you know, just think about this, you know, their mindset was not one of victory, the victory we've been talking about. Their mindset wasn't one of, hey, you know, we're going to do all this great stuff now. The mindset was, I think, despondent. A hope deferred makes the heart sick, it says in Proverbs. You know, they were probably feeling sick to the very core of their being. Everything they'd given up their livelihoods for, Everything they were going for, everything they were believing in, seemed to have completely been torn to pieces. It's, it's like it, I, I can only imagine they were probably at a complete rock bottom, complete rock bottom here. And the truth was, about this, Jesus was alive, and he is alive, and he will stay alive forevermore. So that was just me putting a bit of background to how the disciples were feeling. I mean, I know we can look back and we can say, ah, yes, but we did our study in Mark. And in Mark 8, and Mark 9, and Mark 10, three times Jesus told them he was going to die and rise again. But if you look at them, you can realize that during that time, they argued. They didn't agree with him. They didn't understand what he was saying. And now they're faced with this very real human situation. The more I think about this, the more, the more this is so now. How many people are feeling despondent in despair? Maybe, I mean, I, I can't even turn on the telly right now. Well, no, I can't turn on the telly, I just can't watch the news. Because just, I'm just so fed up watching the news. I mean, how much longer do I have to endure all that's going on. I mean, and and you think, it's so... Oh. <laughs> you know, and so you can kind of feel how the disciples are feeling. It, it's... Oh. You know, I, must say, I, I, I picked out my um, passion version. Let's see if I can dig it out. Because there was a little phrase in here that really got me. It says here... Here we are. It's uh, verse 9 from the Passion Version. It says, Early on the first day of the week, after rising from the dead, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Okay. After she had seen Jesus, she ran to tell his disciples, who were all emotionally devastated and weeping. I thought, whoa. They were emotionally devastated and weeping. Did that just get across where these disciples were? You know, so many times I've been in churches, and there's nothing wrong with this, but you know, you have, oh, let's celebrate the victory of Jesus, all he did on the cross, and let's have a celebration meal through communion. You're thinking, well, maybe sometimes we'd have to get to that point where we realize that those disciples at the time, <laughs> they were on their knees. 
just thinking i mean i, I don't even know if they, what they were praying because i suppose the person they were praying to obviously for them at that point didn't appear to have delivered and yet the truth was for all the time that they were sitting there not believing all the time that they were feeling emotional all the time they were feeling devastated and they were weeping and crying jesus was alive he had done it but they hadn't seen it so there are a few things in here uh, that occur to me firstly I just loved it when you read the angel, not Jesus, but the angel says to Mary, now go and tell his disciples and Peter. Go and tell his disciples and Peter. You see, let's, let's cast our minds back. Let's remember the stories we've been hearing over time because this is, we split into chapters, but sometimes it's really unhelpful because it's a big, it's a book. And we mustn't forget the other parts. So let's remember, as you, many of you will know, Jesus, Peter had said to Jesus, I will never deny you. Jesus said, yes, you will, three times, to which Peter was thinking, no, I won't. Um, then Jesus did, I'm sorry, but Peter did, felt really bad about it, was upset. And this is straight after that. He's now, he's now hopefully with the other disciples, I hope they're with him. And they're all despondent, they're all weeping, and Peter's feeling really bad because two days, three days ago, he had denied him. And the angel says, go and tell his disciples and Peter. Maybe they had to tell Peter because he was somewhere else. Maybe all the disciples were together in one place and they had to go and tell his disciples and tell Peter because Peter was somewhere else feeling really bad. Couldn't even bear to be with his mates because he felt so guilty of what he did. I don't know, but the point is, don't you see, that, G, that the message was not so much worried about condemning the sin or the sinner. The message was bringing comfort to the sinner about the truth of what had happened. I know we, ha we often have this little phrase about, about sin, and, and we must never belittle sin. But God does love the sinner. And if the sinner is prepared to recognize his sin or her sin and turn away from it, God brings comfort and freedom to those who do so. And that's what it says later on in here. We'll come to that. In fact, we'll come to, we'll come to that in a minute. But here, here's something I'll say to you now, just a little teaser. I was very impressed with you all because every single one of you did an amazing act of faith this morning. An amazing act of faith. I won't tell you what it is yet. So here we have a story. Here we have a story of reality. I was thinking about it. Yeah, the, 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 the truth here is we've got, a, we've got Jesus who rose from the dead. And you know, if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, I don't think we'd even know who he was. We wouldn't care right now, would we? Who else can you name from 2,000 years ago who you remember well and can tell me the life of? 500 years ago? 1,000 years ago? I mean, you know names, Shakespeare. We know Shakespeare a few hundred years ago. Don't, I don't, who was he married to? How long did he live? What did he do? <laughs> I don't, I, so, and yet here we have somebody who lived, died, and rose again 2,000 years ago. If there is no ever, other evidence for me that Jesus rose from the dead, it has to be the fact that somebody who had a group of people who were so despondent suddenly changed their message so dramatically to say he's alive that they have sent that message out throughout the world and a larger portion of the world now know who Jesus is. Some don't know him, but they know of him. That has got to be, if anything else, I mean, what would your plan of action be if you're sitting there in a room feeling really bad? You're, you know, I keep, I know, I keep laying it, but you know, your mate's died. He's been dead for a couple of days. Um, the ladies want to go and anoint him because they need to give him a proper burial because he couldn't have one because they quickly rushed him off into a tomb, and that's what these ladies were doing. They were going to give him a proper Jewish burial. Um, would what would your plan of action be? Right, hey guys, let's pretend he rose to the dead and go and let ourselves get killed, telling everyone he's alive. Because 11 of these 12 people all, were, all died. They were all killed for te declaring that Jesus was alive. And one suffered agonies 
even though he died, I guess, of natural causes uh, on his own, on, on, as a prisoner on an island. Is that what you would do? Is, I mean, to me, that seems like the daftest plan of action anyone could come up with. Well, you know, join up with 11 of my mates down the pub. There'll be Steve and Stuart and everybody, and Chris and Pete and Phil and that. Well, well hey, let's start a religion, shall we? <laughs> we're all going to die for it. But it's not true, but we're going to go for it. I mean, I'll just drink my pint and go home. You know, if ever there is something that tells us that there is truth. In fact, I mean, let's, let's get down to basics. Let's get down here. There is no doubt that Jesus existed. No doubt whatsoever. He existed. There's historical evidence. There's more historical evidence that Jesus existed than Caesar or Shakespeare ever existed. This is what I find remarkable. Um, we see historians bickering and, and fighting over things like this, where they declare things that happened historically on the slimmest of evidence, and yet the level of evidence we have here is substantial. And I'm not just talking what the Bible says, even though this is written by eyewitnesses. But take these eyewitnesses out of the account. We've still got other eyewitnesses who don't claim to be Christians who account for this Jesus person. Did he rise from the dead? That becomes more of a question, isn't it? That's, is that provable? Well, I mean, to be honest, on the basis that you guys are, believed to, are happy to believe what they say about Shakespeare or Caesar or that sort of stuff, then he did, because there's enough evidence of people who have witnessed him rising from the dead. There's more credible evidence here than the number of people who have seen UFOs, in my view. And yet people seem more ready to believe in a UFO than, than alien life forms than they are to believe in Jesus rose from the dead. But the fundamental question is, is... Who is Jesus? Not, did he exist? Not, did he rise from the dead? But was he the person he claimed to be? And that, to me, is the fundamental question. But I've gone off. Yeah. So, let's just take a step back and just recall what was happening in that first bit then. So we've got the women coming to anoint Jesus. Yet, yeah, let's remember, don't we remember that two chapters earlier we had that woman who came to the, what we would now call the last night, or the last supper, where she came and anointed his feet with the oil that she would have kept for her own burial, someone in her family. Because I think spiritually she knew there would be no opportunity to anoint Jesus. And that's what these ladies are finding out right now. Three of them have come together to anoint Jesus' body and do the purification rites. And there was no opportunity because he was already gone. So that lady did the most prophetic thing by declaring, by anointing his body for burial because she knew he was going to die. But the reality was she knew there would be no other opportunity to do it because after he died, he would be alive again. See, it all kind of, for me, I, have, I, have, I love sci-fi and I love stories that have story arcs. And of course, one of my favorite series was a one called Babylon 5 because that came in with this whole idea of they'll do episodes, but each episode would have stories in themselves, but then have a bigger story that span over a few episodes, and one big story that spanned over the whole series, and actually one really big story that spanned all five, epi all five series. Everything kind of comes together, and you'll be sitting watching stuff, and you oh, I see what's happening here. I mean, I know it's really nerdy, but that's what I like. And here we have scripture, and don't you see everything starts to fall into place? You had all these pictures coming in from the Old Testament, all these things happening around Jesus, things he said, things people did, and then he, he is raised from the dead. And suddenly, it's, 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 the picture just goes, whoo. Just suddenly becomes clear. This is what Jesus, what God's done. So, the point is, Jesus has conquered death. Jesus has conquered death. We need fear death no longer. You know, As I, was, as I was thinking about this, I began to wonder, is this something that we've started to take for granted? I'm not criticizing, but is it something we've heard so much that we, well, yeah. Yeah, okay. He's conquered death, yeah, I know, that's true. 
it says he's done it, he's done it. And I'm just thinking, have we captured the reality of realizing that we, we need have no fear of anything? We need not be bound by anything. We can pursue whatever God asks us to pursue, safe in the knowledge that he's conquered death, he wears the victor's crown, and that we can do it all knowing that ultimately we'll be with him. It's not about, oh, Jesus, di- Jesus died, Jesus, Jesus rose again from the dead. If I say a prayer, I can follow him. Now when I die, I go to heaven. I don't think that's what it is at all. I think the reality of the truth is Jesus died so that I might live life to the full. I can experience his kingdom here on earth, knowing that when I do die, I will experience his kingdom in all its fullness, in every single way possible. And I know, I know that he's coming again to collect us all. And that, that when, when, when my dad died, it wasn't a defeat. I don't, I don't believe death was what God ever intended when we were first created. It's not a natural thing. I think it came in because of sin. It came in because of what man did. Because man took a choice to rebel against God, to reject what he was saying. And death came in as a judgment. That's why we feel such pain when we get broken. Our our connection gets broken through that process of dying. But there isn't defeat there because we know that that person who knows God can go straight through into his glorious presence and live eternally with him. You see, this is the truth. This is the truth, and this sort of thing should be exciting you. I mean, I don't understand it. I really don't get it. Why is it that we come across, we, I can meet people who say, oh, well, I don't believe, I don't believe there's anything after life. Well, okay. So why are you living? What's the point? Why are you here? Well, I'm an accident. Oh, that's nice then. I mean, I've had an accident in my car, but, I mean, I've hit another car. Um, so, uh, before we get inappropriate there. Um, but, um, you know, okay, you're an accident. And don't you see that we have a message that says we're not accidents, we're here for a per- purpose, and if we realize who God is and accept Jesus for who he is, we can live life to its fullness and, in, and live in the reality of that. And we can show that to everybody else that that is the truth. And sometimes I worry that I, I, I being we, as not just you, that I, we sit in our little homes and we go to our little churches and we meet in our little groups and we don't show people. We're not out there doing it. We're not out there serving people, being witnesses in the way we live, in the way we behave, in what we say and what we do. Jesus is coming. Oh, yeah, well, okay, I'm sure he's coming, but yeah. Game of Thrones is on tonight. I'm, I'm meeting my mates down the Victoria on Friday, and we're going for a nice Chinese or something, you know. How would you feel if God turned up in five minutes' time? If I told you God, Jesus is arriving in five minutes' time, what are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, is it... Is it hallelujah? Is it, uh, oh, oh my goodness. Um, 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 <laughs> you know, what, how, how, how do you feel? I'm saying this because, of course, I'm really pulling on the second half of the passage. You see, there's two, there's two things in here that really challenge me. Firstly, is it two or is it three times people witnessed to Jesus' very followers that Jesus was alive and they didn't believe. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. And Jesus being the nice, gentle, friendly, cuddly soul that he is, his response was, he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. And I just thought, oh, and I just reflected and thought, it reminded me a little bit of our connect group on Tuesday. People prayed about, I, there was a common prayer at one point where people say, I can remember when I became a Christian and how this happened and how that happened and how I felt like this. And you're thinking, yeah, but why isn't that now? If I felt full of the joy of the Lord when I became a Christian, 
then I should have even more joy now, shouldn't I? Because I know him better. Have I allowed the world to harden my heart? Have I lost sight of my true love? Have I allowed unbelief to come in? I know I spoke last week when I was introducing the worship. What's your expectation when you come on a Sunday? What's your expectation for God to do every day? Has, has my experience got to the point where when I became a Christian, I was just so full of the joy and I wanted everybody to know and I'd tell my friends and I didn't care if they didn't want to listen and I just wanted them to know. And yet, have I now become so calloused? Have I become so hard that I've allowed unbelief to come in that I have no expectations? I don't know whether... You know, Jesus is alive. Well, yeah, I accept that. And you will speak in new tongues. Well, that was a few years ago, but I don't bother anymore. You'll cast out demons. Well, I can't find a demon now. I wonder where they've all gone. They're probably all frightened from us. Well, I doubt it. They've probably gone somewhere and are manifesting in ways that man has tried to explain, medicine has tried to cure, and people have accepted as being normal behavior that we should be addressing. They'll pick up serpents with their hands. Well, I'm not recommending go and do that. Let's not all get a flight out to, uh, I don't know, Texas. Go find ourselves a rattlesnake and see how we get on. But the point is, is are we living in the truth that we know that when God is on our side, when God is on our side and I'm in the will of God, I can do all things and he will look after me and he'll protect me and I need fear nothing so that when people try to kill me, if God wants me to do something else, they won't succeed. If something does try and, uh, try and poison me, I w- God will cure me. God will heal me. That I can go and lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. Not for my glory, but as a witness to the glory of God so people might know the truth about who Jesus is. I, I read in my, you know, the Bible in one year thing, and I was reading a Matthew passage, and it said Jesus got so angry, well, he got fr- he, 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 frustrated with the people because he said, look, if I had done these miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. If it happened in Nineveh when Jonah went to witness to them, they would have repented. And you can't even repent. And that showed me something. That showed me that firstly, we're to perform miracles. We're through the power of God, with God on our side, with him always with us, we're going to go out and do miracles if we start believing and attempting, you know, doing it. I think that's the thing. Do it. But it's not the primary goal. I'm not going to run to see signs and wonders. Jesus' priority was to do signs and wonders, to show compassion to the people that they might be drawn to repentance and back to the Father's heart. That's what I think was going on. And that's what we, sh- that's what we should be doing. So when Jesus says, go, he says, go, a doing word. He says, go. We're to go. And we're to do And ultimately, our priority is to bring everyone back to a relationship with God through Jesus. And that's the gospel message. The gospel message isn't that we form help groups to feed the poor, that we form, um, you know, that we we house the homeless. You see, these are natural outwork outworkings of the reality of our relationship with Jesus that we go and meet these people Jesus had compassion on these people and we need to have the same compassion on these people but the fundamental principle of why of of our gospel message is we are to know and teach that Jesus is the only way in fact I mean come to think of it name me one other religion where their leader isn't dead I mean, name me one. Muhammad's dead. Buddha's dead. Okay, some of them, they don't even exist. They're just kind of made up models of elephants and people with lots of arms. But, you know, point to me one place, and yet we can't point to a grave anywhere in the world where Jesus is because he's alive. And 
Before, and let, let me touch on something whilst it occurs to me. Muslims don't believe in who Jesus is. They will tell you he, they do, but they don't. Because the, 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 here's the thing. Muslims' teaching is this. Just before, it's either just before he was crucified or just before he died on the cross. I can't work out which, where it, quite where it is. Muslims believe that God got down, they got hold of Jesus, took him back to heaven, and got someone who looked like Jesus, and that person died on the cross. And that's what they believe. <laughs> Sometimes I think, and they think we're nuts. But the point is, is they, um, they don't believe in who Jesus is. So if you say to me, as I was reading just this week, I am a Christian and a Muslim, it's impossible. Absolutely 100% impossible. You cannot, there's, you're either for God or you're against God. Um, you cannot serve two masters. Either Jesus is alive and he's the Lord and he's king and he's God, or he's not. It's one or the other. So, how did I get on that? Um, in fact, there's another thing, because I, I, everything's coming back to me all of a sudden for what's been going on this week. I saw a newspaper report, I think it was the Guardian, or no, it's the Telegraph, of the envoy to the Catholic Church from the Church of England, who, actually, it was a bit unfair because he said it 10 years ago, but I don't think he's renounced what he said. He said, Christians don't need to believe in the full resurrection of Jesus. I'll be absolutely at categorically here. Yes, you do. It's absolutely quite clear. In fact, let's go to the passage. It says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized. And it's about belief. It's about believing in who Jesus is, what he did, and what he's doing. It's believing. So it's not good enough to know, believe in who Jesus is. Many people believe in God, don't they, Esther? And I've often said to you, lots of people believe in God. And I would say, and so does the devil. But it's not about believing in God. Well, sorry, it's not about knowing in God, believing there is a God. It's about knowing Jesus, knowing God. It's not here. It's sort of here. I laughingly said to you, you did a great act of faith this morning. I mean, I was teasing. But the point is, you all came in and you sat on your chair. I didn't see any of you walk up to the chair, give it a shake, walk around it, have a look at it, lift it up. Oh, yeah, that looks okay. Give it another shake. You know, Beryl, would you sit on this for me, please, just to make sure it's okay before I, I, I risk it? Some of you obviously lounge on your chairs. Um, but the um, point is, you all came and you sat on your chair without question. That's faith. That's belief. You believe that chair would take your weight, it wouldn't collapse, and you were okay with it. That's what faith in Jesus should be like. That unswerving confidence in who God is and what he's done. And so I suppose what I'm getting at is when it says believe and be baptized, it means Accept who Jesus is. He is Lord. He is God. Accept what he's done. He's died in your place and his blood covers all your sins. It's accept that you are, with, you are full of sin. And it's repenting of those sins and taking on board the truth that Jesus died for you. And let that change your life. I challenge anyone who has a genuine encounter with God, with Jesus and what he's done for you, to not have a life that is transformed and transforming as you grow day by day in a greater knowledge and relationship of who Jesus is. You see, it doesn't say, um, no, no, we'll come to that in a minute, but it says who believes, and it says be baptized. And I want to just emphasize that. Be baptized. It's not just believes. It says believes and be baptized. Now, lots of people get in lots of sticky arguments on this. Does it mean to be saved, you need to believe and be baptized? Well, we know that the, the, the thief on the cross confessed who Jesus was. They didn't have time to get him down from the cross, baptize him, and put him back up there again. So he didn't have to be baptized to be saved when Jesus said, you'll be with me. 
and paradise. But I think it's a fundamental aspect of our faith and declaration publicly for who we are and what we believe in. In fact, I was reading the other day that, again, I don't want to pick on Islam, but it's just that I was hearing someone speak about it. And he said, do you know, when you have a baptism, when, when a Muslim becomes a Christian, they're not very happy, the Muslims. But they're okay. When that Christian gets baptized, uh, well, they, they want to kill you. It's amazing. As, as this person put it, the, the, yes, the Muslims get it. They see how important baptism is. Believers' baptism really is that important. And the Christians, it's, it's, it doesn't matter whether they've been baptized or not. So I would, I would challenge you. Firstly, do you know Jesus, as, as Steve said earlier? And secondly, have you been baptized? But um, but the important thing is, I was just thinking about this. Peter was reminded of this in Acts, and I just put up the verse there just for you to read when you want to. But it says, "What must we do to be saved?" And he said, "Repent and be baptized, um, every one of you, in the name of Jesus." And it's this thing about le- believe. It's this thing about believe. I keep coming back to believe. <sighs> and maybe here's one last challenge for you. Steve mentioned John, quoted, although you might not have known it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here we read in verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. It's believes. But it's not very helpful because it's in English. You see, I, I, I don't know what the technical term is. Somebody might understand English better, the, the language better than me, but it's something that you call a, a continuous participle or something, something where it's an ongoing. It's not a right. You sat down. You are still sitting, and then you stand up. I suppose the sitting could be a continuous whatever. You are sitting. So it's not saying whoever believed in Jesus, whoever believed and was baptized. It's not past tense. The gospel message is not, do you, do you accept now that Jesus is who he is? Do you accept as your Lord and Savior? Have you been baptized? Now go on your way. It's whoever believes. And for me, that is fundamental. Do you, are you, how can I say it? Are you continually believing? Are you continually believing? It's no good saying, well, I believed last year, but this year I can be bothered. I believed last year that I shouldn't do this because I knew Jesus, but this year uh, my behavior's changed and it's, it's gone on a bit of a downward spiral because, you know, I don't think it matters quite so much anymore. The point is, it's transformational and it's continuous and ongoing. And we need to know the truth that salvation I, 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 salvation is as much dependent upon where you stand on the day you die as on the day you committed your life to Jesus now might be a shock for some of you I don't know it depends on what you believe but the point is it's no good standing before the throne of God I, when you die it's, it's no good standing before the throne of God saying well I, I, I signed on the dotted line when I was 12 and I believed in you then my lifestyle didn't change, though, when I carried on behaving as if I wasn't a Christian. And when I died, no one could tell the difference and I hadn't really given you a second thought. I think, personally, there will be a frown on the face of the Almighty because you didn't continuously believe. Challenging, I know. But I suppose that's the, that's that's where I think I should leave it. But... Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions. Have you lost that joy? Have you lost all that you knew about God? Do you not want to be restored back to where you were? I learned an interesting thing a few years ago, that restoration doesn't mean that you stop the decay. Restoration means you go back to where you would have been or where you should be. Let's put it that way. 
You don't take a car that's rusting in the field and say, I've restored it because I've put it in a garage and it's all okay under the tarpaulin. No, you restore it by making that car as good as it was new. And when God says he'll come and restore the years the locust has eaten, it means he'll come and make it as if the locust never came. You don't get that. So as if the locust never came. So if there's, if there's times in your life where you're looking, I've got a hole in my life, or I lost it a bit here, I've lost my way, he can restore you back as if nothing's happened. So have you, lo- have you lost have you, have, 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 have you lost sight of your goal? Have you lost that joy? You still believe in who Jesus is, but, but you're not living in the good of it anymore. I believe in who you are, Jesus, and I really trust you. And I read the Bible and I pray to you. But um, all that healing stuff and that, yeah, that, that, that worked in the 1980s, if you're alive then. But maybe not now. All that worship, that powerful worship where I used to, we used to, where you could come and, and be in your presence. Well, yeah, but you've taken your presence away and I just sing songs now. Have you, have you lost oomph, spiritual word, oomph. And have you, and are you still believing? That's a different question altogether. Have you made a commitment? Have you accepted Jesus? But your lifestyle just isn't meeting, just isn't living out what you've declared and you've realized you've let it slip because you are no longer really believing. The more you look at it, you think, actually, I did believe once, but not anymore. Because the good news is, repent and believe. And he'll restore it back to you. Sign that time's done. Yes. The light is shining. So... Can I just share one last thing because uh, this this spoke to me when I was doing a study on angel armies because um, there was a scripture in Joshua five and this this to me is perhaps the third element. You got those people who have just lost belief altogether, who don't believe anymore. They're not believing. There's those who do believe, but they're just. Maybe they're just too, their hopes deferred. They've just lost hope, and they're not. They're, you know, they don't expect God to do anything anymore. So they believe in who He is, and they're still believing, but we don't expect much. But here's this third thing: it said it was about Joshua, and I read this. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him, and his drawn and his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua said to him, "Are you for us or are you against us?" And he said, no. No. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army told him to take his shoes off because it was holy ground. See, the commander of the angel army And what that spoke to me was, it said, Jesus, are you for me or against me? Are you saying no? No. He's saying, are you following in my will? Are you doing what I'm asking you to do? So I think there's a third thing here that occurs to me. Have you tapped into the will of God and are you doing what God's telling you to do? Have you you avoided it? Are you willing to believe? Are you willing to step out in faith? Are you prepared to do what God tells you? Because if you have the will of God, if you know the will of God, the answer is clear. Go. Go make disciples. Go baptize people. Go in the reality of knowing the truth, the experience of healing, of the power of God, because God's on your side. So maybe that's the third section. Are you in line with the will of God? We pray, your will be done. Your will be done. 
What is, your, what is his will for you right now? Don't we want to go? Don't we want to see Burnham saved? Don't we want to see Hybrid saved? Why are we declaring that every stronghold must come down? Every high place must be broken? That all those things, all those giants will be defeated if we have the God of heavenly angels against, on our side? And it's a rallying cry that, yes, Jesus is alive. But it's more than that. He's not just alive. He's, he's seeking that daily relationship with you that you can go and obey his will and work out all those things he wants to take you into and some as you see the church grow. I mean, don't we want to see, I mean, what are, what are your expectations? Do you ever believe that this hall could be filled with people? Do you ever believe that we could see, we could, you know, Peter be struggling to put the PA up because there's nowhere to put it? Or are you happy that, that there's just us? I mean, I'm going to say just. I mean, I don't, it's, not, it's not decrying, but I'd say there's space. Isn't that a waste of space? If God wants to advance, if God is desirous to know people, well, then why have we got space? Are we believing for people? Or are we happy and content with our lot? Anyway, let's, 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 let's stop there. We are Burnham Community Church. You'll find us in Somerset, just five minutes from the M5, Junction 22. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10.30 in the St. John's Ambulance Hall in Highbridge. Watch our website or follow us on Facebook and look out for our banner. Come along and check us out. <laughs>